Chapter 2. Hidden in a Tree Nevin hunched forward as he waded through the curtain of leaves. Why are there soldiers in Elben? he thought. Aishin had always warned him to give the Baron's military a wide berth should they decide to show themselves on the peninsula. Elben was a province under the Barony's jurisdiction, but only just. Its distance from the capital and difficulty in reaching the little town meant practically no ruling body wanted anything to do with them, leaving them mostly to their own devices. It took a special circumstance to draw any authority out to the Tragen, and Aishin had explained that many of them didn't appreciate being sent so far from home sometimes taking advantage of Elvin's seclusion in questionable ways. Sorry, I just... Ow! began a second voice, punctuated by the crack of splintering wood. How are you so good at this? The ground keeps moving around on me before I can get my foot on it. It's not magic. Just use your bloody eyes. Nevin carefully backed through the reaching branches, his eyes following the sound of rustling underbrush and voices even though he couldn't see through the layered foliage. Sound traveled strangely in the woods, the uneven ground and haphazard arrangement of plant life gathering noise in stagnant pools and focused streams like stones in a river. The branches of the fallen maple made for effective camouflage, but that effectiveness was a double-edged sword. The men wouldn't find it without wading in themselves, but the relative dryness of the leaves also meant that any careless movement on his part would be broadcast through hundreds of natural wind chimes. He trapped himself again, and now all he could do was wait. He frowned. But why again, he thought. The first man continued, close enough now that Nevin can hear each bumbling footfall through the brush. Wouldn't need to be stumbling round in here had you just listened to me about that suspicious wheelbarrow in the first place. The stranger's familiar voice scratched at Nevin's mind, stirring up vague recollections of claustrophobia and darkness. He backed even further into the tree, his shoulders bumping the ribbon-esque bark covering the tree in strips. Let's just hurry and find him so we can get back to it, Biggin. Biggin grunted. One of the others can find him. Where's he going to go? Then what are we still doing out here? The crackle of underbrush silenced. Something over here caught the light funny. A patch of metal, maybe. Metal? Evan's eyes slowly inched upward. A wide leather strap swayed gently on the breeze. From his current position, the strap was out of reach but had he been standing, he could have simply reached up and grabbed hold of it. A dull ache swelled between his temples, and fresh beads of sweat leaked from his pores. The sounds of the forest faded, replaced by the forceful thud of his heart. The creases furrowing his brow deepened, and his eyes followed the strap skyward. A small voice begged him not to look, to stay his gaze, to spring free of the fallen maple and dash out into the woods without looking back. But his eyes moved of their own accord. There, said Biggin. Are my eyes playing tricks, or is that a bit of gold I see? Nevin buried a gasp in his hand. At the end of the wide leather strap, wedged between the silver maple's trunk and a particularly thick branch, was Dalen's bronze canteen. All the blood evacuated the young man's body. The drooping branches shuddered, and Nevin could hear someone trying to push their way in. He instinctively slid his feet closer, hoping the abruptness of the motion didn't give away his presence. They didn't move far before the tangle of branches got in the way. Whoa, whoa, hold on a tick. Better leave it be, Biggin. A short pause, and the rustling stopped. That's the first thing of value we come across out here, and you just want to leave it? The first voice grew serious. Come on, we've got a job to do. Let's get back to the team. Uh, Vinkt can wait, and you're crazy if you think I'm leaving this worthless force empty-handed. Look, I don't want to be out here any more than you. These woods are not a place for men, not... Normal men, at least. These country bumpkins make me just as nervous as this trackless forest. They're nothing like the people back home. Things they pray to out here. <laughs> what, like the turnip god? Biggin chuckled. Not Biggin spoke again, his voice low and brimming with agitation. Watch your words, fool. These old woods aren't just filled with trees and game and uncultured hicks. There are things listening. Things without a sense of humor. Things that care very little for the needs and dreams of men. Spirits. Ghosts. Forgotten gods. Oh, your eyes are as brown as that crap you're spewing, Widge. There was a deep sigh from someone, and Nevin imagined the young man named Widge putting his hands on his hips and regarding his partner with a troubled look. A few years back, 
Baron sent a small group of us soldiers into Elven to investigate a rumor. A trapper had taken some pelts into Kummel at a trade, and during a conversation with an off-duty constable, he mentioned running into a strange man out in the deepest parts of these woods. Now see if this sounds familiar. All black garb, wooden mask, glowing eyes. Oh, get off it, Biggin scoffed. Now I know you're busting my... Hey, I'm just telling you what the guy said. It was a fool's errand from the get-go, anyway. Anyone with a half a brain and a tick's knowledge of the land could vanish out here. And we knew it when we set out. But when the Baron gives an order, you pack your bags. We made the trek, set up camp, spent a few days half-assed combing the woods for any sign of this guy. It wasn't until the last day that we stumbled upon the altar. Altar? Nevin leaned forward. But worship is outlawed in the barony. Biggin apparently had the same thought. What do you mean, Alta? We'd hired a guide for the first two days, which continued. A scrawny old goat with what looked like guinea moss growing in the gaps between his rotten teeth. But the field commander got a bad vibe off the guy, like he was leading us in circles and deliberately keeping us from certain areas. On the third morning, we set off without him. Again, we found nothing. Feeling confident in our efforts, wasted as they were, we turned back south as soon as the sun set. Heading up, I don't know how we missed it. Every trail turned directly into this clearing. The trees and underbrush thinned as we got closer. Even the ground itself seemed to funnel us in that direction, rising up on each side like it wanted to ensure the easiest path available led to that opening in the trees. A focal point. He sighed. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy, but it just felt... purposeful. Like there was no other way it could have happened. Unlike fate, Biggin asked, the energy missing from his voice, forgotten at the feet of growing trepidation. Maybe. Maybe not. Nevin pictured Wid shaking his head. Fate can be a cruel bitch for certain, but this... I don't know. The clearing itself was nothing special. An open field, a barely noticeable slope leading down from the mountains. A pile of stones and rotting planks where an old tower once stood. But the altar... It stood right at the center of it all, ringed by clusters of these delicate white flowers, no bigger than your pinky. A grizzled ram's head monument carved from a chipped stone the color of stagnant water. Bits of animal and plant matter at various stages of decay occupied any surface flat enough to hold them. The whole of it reeked of death, decay, and a hint of something else. Like the air surrounding a smith's shop on a windy day. Metallic, acrid. Uh, the kind of smell you feel in the back of your throat. Nevin cocked his head as he listened, growing more and more disconcerted as the story wore on. The Dragon Peninsula stretched out for well over a hundred square miles west of the Hirat Gorge. Not a small area by any means, but having spent nearly a decade of his life exploring the tangled woods and open fields, navigating the quiet streams as they meandered south from the mountains to gather shallow ponds teeming with speckled trout and orange fin perch. And dozing beneath the drooping boughs of tower pines and ageless elms, Nevin felt at home in these woods. Safe, and at peace in ways that living in Dalen's barn had never provided. When he could, he and Adix would spend days at a time lost in the wilderness with nothing but each other's company, before slinking regretfully back to the meager civilization that Elben had to offer. He eventually grew into a comfortable familiarity with the layout of the peninsula. The place is frequented by local trappers. Fishing holes the hidden groves of wild pears and blackberry bushes, abandoned animal dens, areas of unusually stunted or blighted growth, even places so deeply removed from the touch of man that the air literally vibrated with the raw energy of unbridled nature. And in all of those excursions, in all those days spent combing the woods, the two had never once happened upon a clearing where the ram's head altered. It made him question how much he really knew about the lands he called his home. Someone shuffled their feet, it was Biggin that spoke. A ram's head? That doesn't sound like one of the old religions, not from Kamobo at least. Nevin recognized the symbol. As the god of the harvest and the struggle of existence, some of Elbin's older residents still quietly venerated a Vilger. Their dogged insistence that it was their responsibility to cull the weakness from the village in order to overcome the terrible and unforgiving nature of reality was pulled straight from the Vilger's tenants and often placed them at odds with the more relaxed mindsets of the younger generation. According to the elders, the youth of Elben didn't understand the hardships the original settlers overcame in those early years, 
and by forgetting their roots, they were dooming Elbin to an uncertain future. A group is only as strong as its weakest member, Lysian would say. But does Evinger ask too much? Is it not human to care for, protect those who cannot do so for themselves? That's exactly my point, said Widge. It takes a certain kind of weird to willingly plant yourself out in the middle of nowhere and survive. A certain strange kind of thought process, a way of thinking that calls out to the wilds, the shadows, the emptiness. And sometimes, when you call out to the emptiness long enough, loud enough, things answer. The brush crackled as someone shifted uncomfortably. Telling the story was getting Widge worked up, and the fervor of his words only increased as he continued. A number of trinkets were scattered atop that crude altar, mixed in with the rotting plants and carcasses. Handcrafted bits and baubles that likely had little more than sentimental value to their owners. Polished rocks, crystals, animal carvings, that sort of thing. Offerings to whatever being that ram's head supposedly venerated. Now, I wanted precisely nothing to do with that forsaken block of stone, and had I been leading that particular excursion, I would have immediately ordered my men to eyes forward and haul boots out of the trigon. Some things are better left ignored. A soft rustling of leaves tickled the edge of Nevin's attention. For a moment, his focus shifted away from the two men and magnified that fleeting interruption in a way that only a mind tuned to the unique nature of the woods could. The three of them were no longer alone. Widge's tone darkened. But I wasn't the leader that day. I was just another soldier. And in truth, that altar made me feel things I didn't understand. Not until after. After what? Again, the soft crackle of leaves. Closer now. He supposed it could simply be a curious squirrel, or a small bird rummaging through the moist detritus for a hidden earthworm. But instinct told him otherwise. And that's when he realized the woods had gone completely silent. His name was Charles, but everyone just called him Bags. Had a number of these little pouches strapped to his belt, his vest tucked down in his boots, each one holding something different. He called them his memories. You see, Bags wasn't exactly... whole. Took a blow to the side of his head when he was a kid. Spooked a horse. Was never the same after that. He could still function, mind you. Still talk, walk, shit by himself. Aside from the jagged scar he tried to hide beneath this unruly mass of curls, he was about as normal as they come. He wanted to be in the military since he was a little kid, and despite the accident, that never changed as he grew up. He paused. Maybe even because of the accident. See, unless you got to know him, really sat down and talked to him, you'd never be able to suss out exactly what broke inside him when that horse kicked. People are naturally forgetful, especially about the little things where you left your shoes the night before, whether you cleaned your pipe last time you used it, those sorts of things. Bags didn't just have trouble with the little things. Bags couldn't remember the specifics of a conversation he'd had five minutes ago. Didn't matter what you told him, in one ear, out the other. Biggin scoffed. Come on. That, this was a soldier? How could he learn to fight, learn procedure, the names of his crew? How could he do his job? He had a lot of help. Friends he could lean on, followed around, depended on for direction. The captain made sure they came up together, ended up in the same units. Despite his disability, Bags wasn't stupid. Somehow he figured out that the knowledge was there, and that head floating around like a dinghy on troubled waters, masses of them just jostling about in that broken gourd of his. You see, he needed an anchor, something real and tangible to connect this world to that. Any time he had an experience he wanted to remember, he took something from the environment, familiarized himself with it, and added it to one of his bags. Dozens of bags, each one connected to a specific moment in time through an object with a unique scent, texture, or design. Wait, Biggin whispered, realization washing over him. He, he took something, didn't he? From the altar, I mean. Widge cleared his throat, but failed to steady the emotion in his voice, though Nevin wasn't sure if it was excitement or apprehension he was hearing. <clears throat> Later that night, after the squad settled back into base camp, Bags shuffled out of the trees, straight out of the darkness, cradling his right arm tightly against his stomach, this dazed, faraway look in his eyes. We hadn't even realized he was gone, not until he reappeared, that is. He grunted. <laughs> he only paused for a moment before crouching down by the fire, dumping a handful of random items in the dirt, 
He started picking through them, one by one, muttering to himself, getting increasingly loud and agitated. We slowly gathered behind him, the whole troop. Watching over his shoulders, he threw bits of forest trash into the fire. And that's all they were. Just pine cones and acorns and sticks and rocks. He kept checking each one, sniffing it, rubbing it on his face, even tasting some of them. He quickly broke into tears and started throwing them in the fire more and more rapidly. Finally, the field commander shoved past us, jerking bags to his feet and demanding to know what his problem was. Devin had to lean forward to hear the end of Widget's story he'd grown so quiet. My commander let him go almost immediately, stumbling back from bags that the guy had struck him. I won't repeat the string of profanities that escaped his mouth as he tried to get a handle on what he was seeing, what we were all seeing. Biggin's words were all breath and wonder. What? What did you see? Bags was drenched in blood, from his stomach to his knees. How we didn't see it when he walked out of those woods, I'll never know. Blood looks black in the night, even with a roaring fire up against it. The man lifted his right arm, his hand, and just stared at it, only... There was no hand, just a bloody stump, still wet and oozing. I don't know how he had the strength to stand, let alone speak, but he kept saying the same thing over and over and over, growing louder every time he said it, until he was screaming at us, screaming so forcefully that strings of spittle dangled from his trembling lips. Damn it, Wedge, what was he saying? You're killing me, you! Nevin nodded unconsciously. Wedge took a steadying breath. He said, If I burn them, will I forget? How many do I have to burn before I forget those terrible eyes? Nevin choked down the lump in his throat. While he'd never himself come upon the altar which described, the man had hit upon Elbin's connection to Vilger in a way that lent some weight to the tale, enough so that Nevin was like to keep one eye over his shoulder in the future trips to the Tragen. Nothing moved beyond the tangled branches. Nevin held his breath, knowing even the smallest of movements would call attention to him in the tense silence. He prayed the story had done the trick, had dissuaded Biggin from wanting to retrieve the canteen, and any moment now they would... Oh, that's some good hog shit, witch. With an amused chuckle, he offered his companion a slow clap. <laughs> you can't actually expect me to believe that just because some half-wit gets his end chewed off in the woods after stealing some worthless bauble from a goat-shaped Uncle Rock, I'm serious, Biggin ignored him, and the branches ahead of Nevin began to shift. You really had me going there a minute, and you should save your campfire tales for some wet-eared cobble dogs. Kids will eat that forest called crap right up. But as for me, I'm getting my treasure. Hand-eating monsters be damned. Nevin had about ten seconds before the man waded into the tree and revealed his hiding spot. Despite his memory issues, these soldiers were an unknown quantity, strangers to the area with an agenda all their own. But he remembered the bloodstains on their heavy cudgels. He remembered hiding from them. He remembered the fear the sound of their voices invoked, and every instinct he possessed told him being found would end poorly. Too bad he had no choice in the matter. The leaves parted, and a man's face, all nose and slack jaw, peered down at him in blatant surprise. Nevin pressed back against the maple's trunk. Widge's annoyance was obvious. What is it now? I found that kid we were looking for. Oh, now you're pulling my... A rumbling growl cut him short, deep and menacing him from somewhere above. Biggin's eyes jerked up, widening instantly in fear. Twigs and leaves rained down on Nevin's head, and the length of the fallen maple jerked as a streak of golden fur collided with the soldier's face, and Biggin disappeared just as suddenly as he appeared. Both men screamed, first in surprise, and then pain, and Nevin could only imagine the scene unfolding just a few feet in front of him by the furious cacophony that followed. He wasted little time taking advantage of the rapid change in circumstance.